Greetings, and welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm for the third installment in our little series on steels for forging and blacksmithing and how to understand them and how to choose them. Very briefly, the first in this series was a chalkboard talk where I went over all of the <laughs> little details that you need to understand. A very, very simplified, very oversimplified explanation of some of the metallurgy behind the different steels and the names and alloy numbers and all of that sort of stuff. I do recommend, if you're really serious about getting into this craft, that you do watch that one first. The link will be in the description below so you can find it easy. The second was a list of recycled steels that I quite enjoy using in my own work. Again, I'll put a link in the description box below to that. This one is sort of the negative half of that coin. Recycled metals that I don't like. I'm phrasing that the way I am for a reason. When you start going to any kind of the blacksmith forums or some of the uh, social media pages and whatnot around beginner blacksmithing, there's a lot of arguments about all of the recycled metals. And those arguments tend to descend into a place of two people arguing over whether something should or should not be used. I'm of the opinion that that is a foolish way to frame the conversation. All metal is good metal for something. If that were not true, it would never have been manufactured in the first place. But all metal is bad metal when misapplied. So the argument isn't what you should or should not use. What we really need to do is to dig in a little bit deeper, understand what these materials are, what they do, and when we're talking about recycling, understand how their use history impacts what they are today. Because used material is not the same as the day it was made. And then you can take that information <laughs> You can combine it with knowledge over the problems that you face and the opportunities that you have and what you want to make and make well-informed decisions about your own work to set yourself up for success. That's the goal. <clears throat> so in describing metals that I don't prefer, I'm going to talk about what they are, what they're made of, how their use history has impacted them, where that's relevant, and why I don't prefer them. That's to give you information, to give you background knowledge, so that you, when you're looking at things, can sort the information better and recognize what's in front of you when you're holding a piece of metal a little bit better, so that you can make better informed decisions. Mm -hmm. So, hopefully that interests you, and we'll go dig in and look at some metal examples. So the very first metal that I want to talk about making sure you never use in your forge is anything that's been galvanized. <laughs> the reason is because when the zinc used in the galvanization process gets hot, it outgasses. Those gases, when breathed in, cause a profound inflammatory response in your body called metal fume fever. I have had it. It is terrifying, and it is not fun at all. And when I got metal fume fever, I got it on an open forge, just out in the open, just like I am today. But I wasn't wearing a respirator. Even if you have a respirator and wear it, which is a good idea whenever you're using recycled steel, um, still don't put anything galvanized in your forge, because some of those zinc vapors will recondense on your forge and then outgas again next time you use it, when you might not be expecting trouble. But trouble could still come. So I want to give you the strongest possible warning to avoid galvanized metal. Now this gate behind me is galvanized. You can see it here in the gray color. But if you look here, over on this upright, it's starting to rust through the galvanized coating. And you can no longer tell just by looking at the spot that it was once galvanized. The piece that gave me metal fume fever is this piece right here. I talked about this in the preceding video, so I'm not going to belabor it in this one. Go check the link in the description for the full story. But this piece was galvanized, but has rusted through to the point that you can no longer tell just on visual inspection that it was galvanized. 
So even if you can't see the zinc coating, if you're looking at something that is a part which commonly is galvanized, don't use it for forging. You can still use it for lathe work, for machining, for CNC work, for anything cold, but do not forge it. Do not use it in anything that would go near a campfire or a fire pit, because even that's enough heat to get it to outgas. Do not arc weld or braze to it, okay? Keep it cold. The other option, you know, if you, if this was some sort of post-apocalyptic setting and I only had this bar of metal and I had to make a tent stake, file off the entire surface. But that's a pain in the butt. It's possible, but it's a pain in the butt. And I've got enough other stuff. I just got rid of this whole stack of metal after the first piece gave made me sick. It's just better that way, safer that way. So again, I wanted to lead out this video with this very strong warning. Be next level cautious about galvanized material. And you also have to throw in there some of the metallic anti-fouling paints that are put on some, industri in, on in some industrial settings. A lot of those have metals or metal oxides in them that can also give you metal fume fever. So anti-fouling paints, just as bad as galvanized. Okay, let's look at some other stuff. The next metal that's often talked about that I don't prefer <laughs> in my own work are these small home shop sized saw blades. So we have the circular version like this chop saw um, and we have small band saw blades from like portable sawmills and resaws and things like that. Now, the two reasons I don't prefer these are the material they're made out of and the size. So if we look at, we'll start with the circular saw blade and we talk about size. There's really not that much to work with in here okay, compared to a big industrial saw blade anyway. Also, the gullets in the bottom of each tooth pattern, those often have stress fractures in them. So you need to cut in farther than you think you do to get away from that. Mm -hmm. And this one's not too bad, but you see these stress relief cuts down in it. These can get really exaggerated and really deep into the blade before in some models. So before you even start working with it, you're cutting around Swiss cheese. And that's not something I enjoy doing. I want to start with a good solid chunk of material. Second, the, the material it's made out of. 80s and earlier, most of these circular saw blades are 1080, 1095, something like that, one of the 10 series. And in modern time, if you don't have a welded on carbide tooth, they're still probably 1080, 1095. But as we've gotten better and better at making these, we've gotten cheaper and cheaper at making the rest of it. So as time has moved forward, the quality of material going into these circular saw blades has declined. So it's a lot of work cutting around Swiss cheese for what's probably mediocre material. If this were a post-apocalyptic world and that's all I got, would I make something out of it? Oh my gosh, yes, I would. But when I have a big pantry of stuff that I enjoy working with it, that's not worth adding to the pantry, right? What could you use it for? Well, if you have one that lacks carbide teeth or you know is older, <clears throat> and you want to use it for something, what I would recommend would be a stock removal project. So cut it out to final shape, make a small, you know, small paring knife for the kitchen, small carving knife for woodworking, small skinning blade for field dressing a deer. Um, you know, something where the blade's gonna be your index finger or shorter. You can just do a direct stock removal project out of something like this you would want to anneal the blade, cut out your part, and then reheat treat it. Um, that'll work for you. And you'll probably have a pretty decent result. You would definitely want to put the bottom of those gullets in the handle, not in the blade. Because if this is all the way out in, in the end of your handle, it's not really going to hurt anything if there is a little stress fracture there that you miss. 
but I have much nicer material and I don't want to mess with all of that nonsense. So I'm just going to throw those away when they wear out. <laughs> okay, it's just not worth it. Um, the other one is this, the, uh, the bandsaw blade. These small bandsaw blades, if you're looking at this and thinking, hey, that's a lot bigger than my bandsaw blade, why are you calling it small? Well, because it's not a big industrial blade. If you want to see what a big industrial blade looks like, I'll show you one in the previous video. Description, link in the description box. I'll plug my own video. That's a big bandsaw blade. This is not a big bandsaw blade. These smaller inch to two inch <coughs> wide bandsaw blades are 10 series, pretty most of the time. There are some fancy ones you can get, but they're really expensive. Most small sawmill operators are trying to cut cost as much as possible, and they're using the cheap 1095 ones. It's too thin to weld well in a pattern welded project. And it's way too thin to directly reuse as a stock removal project, with one exception. And that's the reason I have this, actually. And that's making your own saw blade for a frame saw. So this is a project that I want to work on at some point here in the near future. I want to make myself several frame saws for woodworking. And I want to experiment with snapping the existing teeth off and refiling new gullets and make my own tooth pattern. And I'm going to see how it works. I haven't done it before. It's an experiment. So I have this piece of bandsaw blade for that experiment. But you don't want to try and forge on any of this. It's just not going to give you a good outcome. This can go into the scrap heap. So, um, again, this stuff gets talked about a lot. If you have it and it's all you have and it's your first project, go play with it, have fun. But if you're really getting into it and you really want to make good, predictable results, the juice just really isn't worth the squeeze on most of these. Not that it's terrible. It's better than a lot of the other stuff we're discussing in this video. But there's just not enough there to really be worth your time to fight your way through the problems. <laughs> okay, let's go look at some more stuff. So, this is a classic example of what not to buy. This is a drawer full of files. You're going to find drawers full of files at yard sales and flea markets all the time. And you should really never buy them if they look like this. This is not how you store files. Every time these teeth bump against each other, they're taking their edge off and you're going to cut the life of the file in half or three quarters. You can actually ruin a file by shipping. If you, two files are shipped face to face in the mail, they can be completely ruined by the time they arrive to you in one round of shipping. Okay, this is terrible. So you don't really want to buy these as files unless you find a really rare shape that has a little life in it. Yeah, maybe occasionally, but generally no. And you don't want to buy files for using as blade steel or tool making steel. The reason is, if you look at one of these, all of those teeth have been punched in to cold steel with a chisel. That means that there is a stress fracture at the bottom of each and every one of those teeth. You can recover the steel by annealing it and grinding all of those teeth off. It's not worth it. Okay, most of the time it's not worth it. The, um, the steel that's used in these is not spectacular. It, a lot of it is 10 series. Some of the really good ones in the 50s and 60s were W1. Uh, but modern files are getting lower and lower in quality. They're going to air hardening steel. And a lot of them are even just case hardened mild steel. So it's not even hardenable in the core. So yeah, there's a good one now and then, but most of the time the juice is not worth the squeeze. I would avoid file steel. There's much cheaper, more accessible, and better sources of steel for your forging projects than these things. Now, there's always an exception. A file I would buy for foraging would be a big coarse rasp like this of just about any quality because you can use them for hot rasping. 
and rasps are only useful for hot rasping for a short period of time and they get wrecked. So yeah, if you can find one of those that's cheap and is halfway wrecked and you'll get five or six projects out of it and then throw it away, go for it. Buy those for your hot rasping work. Other than that, leave them alone. The second type of file that is worth getting are really, really, really old antiques. Because if you can find a pre-Bessemer process file, it is either crucible steel, which is ho-hum, it's not any better than modern steel. But sometimes, instead of being crucible steel, it will be blister steel. And if you can get a chunk of old-fashioned antique blister steel, now you have something that is a unique material and is valuable for historic recreation work. Get those. But they're very few and far between. Don't hold your breath as to whether or not you're going to find them. Now, I hear you saying, but Adam, I've read a whole bunch of old books that say that file steel is great steel. Yes, I know you have. And at a certain point in history, that was not untrue. However, you have to keep in mind what people are comparing something to when they declare it good. During the fur trade era, most of the commercial knives available were just wrought iron. It's soft. It's not any better at edge retention than bronze. Okay? Steel was extremely hard to come by, extremely expensive, and extremely rare. So your commercial knives were primarily wrought iron. If you take blister steel or even case hardened wrought iron that's been folded a couple times and compare a knife made out of that to the commercial and expensive knife that's just made out of straight up wrought iron, yeah, the file steel wins hands down every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Okay? But the only reason it wins in that time period is because of how trashy the other material it was competing against was. Okay? It was the least smelly turd in the punch bowl, not actually good by modern standards. And you have to keep that in mind when you're reading old sources. They're comparing things to different things than we are comparing things to. You also have to keep that in mind when you're reading old um, information on how to forge and how to make good tools because you get a lot of modern myths like packing steel and BS like that out of old instructions that referenced old materials which are no longer available. Okay, So do keep that in mind. Perspective matters. If all you have is wrought iron, any file is miracle metal. But when you can go to the store and buy inexpensive six, eight, ten dollar a pound, ten ninety five, any filed material is trash and the juice isn't worth the squeeze. So here's an example of a good material that's been so abused over the course of its life that it's no longer useful for direct recycling by a blacksmith. And that is these cultivator teeth. So these are good steel. They're very good quality, clean steel. Usually these are 1080 or so. They're hardened, but after hardening, they're drugged through the ground and bounced off rocks again and again and again and again and again. And that's the equivalent of pounding on them cold after hardening. So I can absolutely guarantee that these teeth will be chock full of cracks that you can't see and if you try to make a part out of them, it will break, okay? Another item that's a popular one to argue over on forums are lawnmower blades. Same category as these. They are good clean steel, but they have an additional problem that not all of them are high carbon steel. Some of these are made out of mild steel some of these are made out of 1080 and left soft. That's because, again, they're bounced off of rocks and stumps and roots and every other thing in your yard, and they, you don't want them to shatter and go flying all over the place. 
So the ones that are made out of high carbon steel are less soft. That means they don't have quite as many stress fractures as here, but you have much more of a mystery meat component to them. Now, I will grab lawnmower blades if they're free. Okay? Why would I just told you they're full of cracks? And the answer is because not everything needs to be hard. So if you want to make something like a garden cultivator or a little small hoe, a little garden trowel, something like that, this is a reasonable material to use as long as you're going to forge it and then leave it be. Leave it soft. Forge it, normalize it, you're done. It's fair game for that. Do not try to make any kind of hardened edge tool out of either of these materials. You're only asking for frustration and upsetting times when they break. If you're enjoying this video, I would be most grateful and honored if you'd give it a thumbs up so that the YouTube algorithm knows that you're enjoying it and can show it to others. Thank you so much for doing so. There's two more metals that I want to talk about as metals that I don't prefer using. And I specifically want to talk about these because so many people want to use them. Um, I just want to describe what they are and why I don't enjoy them so that you know going into something what you're getting yourself into. First of them is rebar. This is one of the most common and readily available recycled materials in existence, which is why everybody wants to do something with it. The problem with it, the reason I despise the stuff and most experienced smiths join me in despising the stuff, is that it's so gosh darn inconsistent. When they make this stuff, they're making it out of the sludge, garbage, and dust at the bottom of a pile of recycled material. Okay, Everything good that can be stripped out and recycled for a specific purpose is done so. And then all of the trash left at the bottom of the magnetically active pile goes into the rebar pot. All the material has to do at the end of the day is meet a minimum tensile strength requirement and it's done. It's not well melted, it's not well mixed, it's not well handled, it's not tested for composition. It's melted, rolled, spat out of a machine, and sold to be mixed with concrete. Okay. So when you get a piece of this, even within the same bar, one section might be beautiful, buttery, mild steel because that's what went into the melt in that section. The next section might be really hard to forge because it's high carbon material. The next section might have had so much cast iron mixed in that it's brittle and cracks when you try to work it. And then back to buttery smooth, right? And anything in between can be true of it. Now, are there tools made out of re rebar? Yes. I have in my little collection of antique stuff some antique rebar that was made into a chisel. Right? I would not choose to use it as a chisel, but somebody did. And if you're comparing rebar to wrought iron, yeah, rebar will make a better chisel than wrought iron. But that doesn't mean it's good by modern standards. <clears throat> Also, you may have just gotten lucky, right? There are people out there who say, I have made a rebar knife and I love it. Okay. If you love it, I'm not going to tell you to throw it out. What I will say is that you got lucky. And that person made a good rebar tool by sheer dumb luck of having picked the right section and the right piece of rebar. You can't plan to make a woodworking tool pick up rebar as your material and execute the process with consistent quality results. You just can't do it. Okay. The only way to make rebar consistently high quality is to throw it back in the furnace, bubble enough air in it that you burn out every impurity, burn it all the way back to pure iron, and then remix it with known composition. And that's not something you can do as a smith. Okay. So it's miserable to work because of how inconsistent it is. Now, as with many other things I've talked about here, I will give you one thing that I like to do with rebar. 
And if it's, if it's free or darn close to it, I will pick it up and take it home. And that is 10 steaks. I do like to make rebar 10 steaks. I even have a video on this channel making a rebar 10 steak. And the reason I like rebar for 10 steaks is the texture that it has. These ribs really grab the soil well, especially in a loose or sandy soil. So I like it for that. And a 10 steak doesn't have to be good metal. You can use any old trash for a tent stake as long as it has enough tensile strength to not bend when you're ripping it out of the ground at the end of your camping expedition. So that goes back to its original design use. Random trash metal with a minimum tensile strength. Okay, So that's rebar. If you want to make tent stakes, great. A lot of smiths will use this for like welding onto other things to make a handle. Great. But in terms of dependably and predictably using this for toolsmithing, no, get something else. Okay? So that's rebar and why I dislike it and its exception. The last one I don't even have an example of, and that's railroad spikes. I dislike railroad spikes so profoundly, I do not have one anywhere in my stash of stuff to even hold up and show you. Okay? Um... Railroad spikes, I'm talking about modern railroad spikes here. Really ancient railroad spikes are a different story. They're wrought iron. We're going to do a video somewhere <laughs> along the line entirely on wrought iron, and we'll talk about that stuff then. But modern era railroad spikes are basically rebar in a railroad spike. Okay, It's something mild to low carbon steel. It's not dependably consistent. It's not good material that's intended for anything other than being hammered into the ground right and for all the reasons that rebar does not need to be quality material to perform its job a railroad spike does not need to be quality material to perform its job it just has to survive being hammered in and it will hold the rail in place from scooching sideways right it's all it's got to do so are there people <coughs> excuse me still recovering from the little illness that we had that's delayed the series. Are there people that have successfully made a railroad spike knife that looks like a knife? Yes, but most of them are wall hangers. Are there a few that somebody put a really sharp edge in? Yes, because you could put a sharp edge on pure copper. Okay. Quality of the material does not determine how sharp an edge you can make. It determines how long it will hold the edge you have made. Are there a few, so are there a few railroad spike knives out there that people think are really good because they cut one piece of chicken with it and then hung it back on the wall and they never gave it an opportunity to get dull? Yes, those exist. Are there a few even smaller number of railroad spike knives that took and actually held an edge because the smith got lucky and picked up a good one. Yes. Those exist too. Just like some sections of rebar will have the right carbon content to, to hold a good edge, some sections of railroad spike will have the right carbon content to hold a good edge. But it's by accident, not by design. And you don't want to put yourself in the position of exerting all of this effort into making a tool when you can't predict what the characteristics of the end result will be. It's not a good use of your time. Okay. Now, railroad spike knives have become something of a rite of passage in a lot of blacksmiths' journeys. I've never made one. I think they're dumb, but that's just me. The uh, If you want to make something which looks like a railroad spike knife I have heard of companies making cast steel railroad spike lookalikes that are 1080 1095 something like that okay get one of those then you can predict that your effort will have a quality result it will still look like a railroad spike knife but you won't have the problem of unpredictable material and you won't have the legality issues of owning a piece of railroad company property and they never vacate ownership of those spikes and rails. Okay, Unless you have a letter from the company saying that this was abandoned, dis disposed of property, they can actually get you for possessing stolen property if you have rail or spikes. 
So, at le- I'm not a lawyer, at least to the best that I understand it. There's a legality issue there, just like with like milk crates, right? The old story of the milk crate company that all milk crates were technically stolen, right? Same thing with railroad spikes. So if you want to make a railroad spike knife, try to find one of those companies. I, I haven't looked them up. It's not something I really care to do in my own work, but try to find something like that or get a piece of you know, car axle or something with a predictable carbon content, forge it into a railroad spike, and then forge a knife off, out of it. Go that route if you want something that looks like a railroad spike knife because then you have predictable material with predictable properties. So that's my advice on railroad spikes. Now, before parting company, the last thing I want to say is just a very positive thing. In this video, I've talked about a bunch of materials that I don't prefer to work with. What I don't want to do here is discourage a beginner from doing your first project. If you just got a forge and an anvil and a hammer and you, you haven't built up a big pantry of materials that you can go to and pick through and pick out the best for everything, and you just want to do something and feel how it feels to forge, use what you got and don't overthink it. Okay? Don't make a hardened edge tool for your first project, but I'd say that anyway. But, you know, if all you have is a lawnmower blade, for, per se, we'll just stick to that. You, you have a couple of lawnmower blades sticking around in, sit in your garage. Go make something out of them. Don't make a knife. Make a garden trowel. But make something out of them and have fun doing it. Learn. Your first several dozen projects are going to be about learning, not about production anyway. So take some of that mediocre scrap and use it as a learning exercise. That is absolutely legitimate. Don't ever let anybody talk you out of doing that. Unless it's galvanized, but that's its own story. We've talked about that here. So go have fun. And that's my single biggest piece of advice to beginners. Don't ever let anybody talk you out of having fun and doing your first project. Grab that piece of rebar. Grab that piece of uh, black iron, mild steel. Grab that lawnmower blade. Grab whatever you've got and make something fun out of it. Don't make anything that needs heat treating, but just have fun experimenting with your new hobby, right? And you will have fun. You will start to learn. And I just wish you all of the best in that exercise. So with that, I hope that you've enjoyed this video, and I hope that you will join us next time here at Old Ways Rising.